Good morning and welcome to New Bethel Baptist Church. We're glad that you are here today. We want you to join in. Grab your Bible. Be ready to study God's Word in just a moment. But right now, sing along with our praise team as we worship the Lord together. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrong since Jesus came into my heart. I have lied in my soul for which long I have sought since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Floods of joy on my soul like the sea billows roll Since Jesus came into my heart I'm possessed of a hope that is steadfast and sure Since Jesus came into my heart And no dark clouds of doubt now my pathway obscure Since Jesus came into my heart since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy on my soul like the sea billows roll, since Jesus came into my heart. And I shall go there to dwell in that city I know, since Jesus came into my heart. I'm happy, so happy as onward I go Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Floods of joy on my soul like the sea billows roll Since Jesus came into my heart your kingdom come here let your will be done here in us jesus there is no one greater you alone are savior show the world your love king of heaven Let your glory reign, shining like the day, King of heaven come, King of heaven rise up, who can stand against us, you are strong to say in your mighty name, King of heaven come, we are children of your mercy. Rescue for your glory, we cry, Jesus, set our hearts towards you, that every eye would see you, lifted high. King of heaven, come down, King of heaven, come down. Let your glory reign, shining like the day, King of heaven come. King of heaven rise up, who can stand against us? You are strong to say in your mighty name, King of heaven come. King of Come down, 
Let your glory reign, shining like the day. King of heaven, come. King of heaven, rise up. Who can stand against us? You are strong to save in your mighty name. King of heaven, come. King of heaven, come. King of heaven. Again, welcome to worship. What is in a name? Do you know the meaning of your name? My first name is Robert. Robert originates from an ancient pre-Germanic language. It's a combination of two words. The first means fame or famous, and the second is bright or shining. My middle name is earnest, and that name means serious. So my names combined mean that I am seriously bright. <laughs> if only I could live up to that name. I was named after my father, so I have a junior in my name. My middle name, Ernest, has become a family name. I'm the fourth, and then my son's the fifth, and my grandson is the sixth, Ernest, in a row in our family. <laughs> it, it could have been worse. My grandfather, who started the whole Ernest trend, had the middle name of Lumpkin. <laughs> what do you think? I might have gotten some serious teasing as a child if my name had been Lumpkin. Our names identify us. I guess it's always been that way. Back in the Bible, names were significant to the individual person. Oftentimes, uh, biblical names were aspirational. Uh, they were given to people hoping that they would live up to the attribute which their name meant. Today, we're going to look at a person who, as far as I can tell, never had anyone named for him in the biblical record. Now, we've come across his name three times so far in our study of the book of Hebrews. And he will be today the, the chief illustration as we continue to see all of the ways that Jesus is better. In fact, I, I want to tell his story before we begin to read from and study from Hebrews chapter 7, which is where we'll be today if you want to start turning there. But the story of this man is found in the book of Genesis in chapter 14. In that chapter, we see that a war is going on between two sets of city-states. The, the kings of several cities with their territories have banded together to fight another group of cities and their kings. One of the cities that is defeated is the city of Sodom. And the victorious kings took everything that they could carry away from Sodom, including the people, which means they captured Lot, the nephew of Abram, who we know as Abraham. When Abraham hears that the nephew Lot was captured, he takes the 318 men of his household and he pursues and then defeats the armies of the four offending kings. All of the spoils of that war, that is all that the kings had brought with them and what they had captured, Abraham takes back with him. And then we read this in Genesis 14, verses 18 through 20. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. And he blessed him, Abraham, and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. And that 
is all we know from the Old Testament of this man, Melchizedek. The only other time his name is mentioned in the Old Testament is in a prophecy in Psalm 110. That prophecy is quoted three times already in the book of Hebrews, and each time that prophecy is applied to Jesus. It says, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, we saw this prophecy quoted in chapter 5, verses 6 and 10, and then we ended last week in chapter 6, verse 20. So let's begin there as a reminder. Turn to Hebrews chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And now look at chapter 7, verses 1 through 17. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness. And then he's also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. See how great this man was, to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils. And those descendants of Levi, who received the priestly office, have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers, though these also are descended from Abraham. But this man, who does not have his descent from them, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. And in the one case, tithes are received by mortal men, but in the other case, by one of whom it is testified that he lives. One might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. Now if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arrive after the order of Melchizedek rather than one named after the order of Aaron? For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah. And in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priest. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. Jesus is better than Levi. We've already looked at Jesus is the better priest. We did that when we studied the end of chapter 4 and the beginning of chapter 5. We're going to see today that Jesus is, is not simply better than the priest that were serving at the time of his death. He's identified with a superior lineage of priest. Jesus is, is better than Levi in his calling, in his heritage, in his function, and most importantly, in his service. To get to that point, we've got to understand a little more about this person, Melchizedek. If it wasn't for the book of Hebrews, the name Melchizedek would be 
be only some obscure and kind of mythical person from the story of Abraham. But there is quite a bit that is significant about this man. The reason the author is inspired to bring up this rare character is because these Hebrew people, these Jewish followers of Jesus, were being tempted to go back into a system dominated by the priesthood. The, the system of belief, the Jewish faith, was led by the priests. The rules, the laws, the practices were interpreted by the authority of the priesthood. The priests that we're talking about were direct descendants of Levi, the third son of Jacob. Aaron, the older brother of Moses and the first high priest after the law was given, was also from that line. Thus the comparison to Levi and also the mention of Aaron in this scripture. So, so let's get into breaking down this passage. Now I did see where one pastor whom I respect said that he was tempted to, to skip this whole chapter because of the technical nature of it, the direct application to the Hebrew people, but perhaps not so much to us. But I think it's important for us to know and to understand the argument that we find here, and that will be our goal today. The, the final thing we want to answer today is, why is this important to us? This passage is written in such a way as to remind us uh, it reminds me, anyway, of kind of a modern legal document. <laughs> Have you ever tried to read a, a legal document, whether that would be a, a court filing or a contract or a, or a piece of legislation? They're wordy and they're technical and they're difficult. The, the thought pattern is based on really old traditions and on old precedents. And after all is said and done, it seems, at least to me, that it could have been stated in a way which was much less complicated and certainly less technical. But that's what we get in legal documents. So we're going to examine this passage. We're going to examine it by asking questions. Let's start with this question. Why Melchizedek? Why Melchizedek? Why make the argument for staying with Jesus and not going back to Judaism with a character who is barely mentioned in the scripture. Melchizedek is a part of the prophecy of the future of Israel. Psalm 110 verse 4 is a messianic prophecy and it talks about a priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek is seen in the story of Abraham as being superior to Abraham. Verses 2 and 4 of our passage today say that Abraham gave a tithe, a tenth of all of the spoils to this man. He's someone to whom Abraham must have had great respect and to whom Abraham acted in submission. Verse 1 says that this man Melchizedek met Abraham and blessed him. Now, this speaks of their relative positions to one another. And verse 7 makes it clear it's beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. Abraham was inferior to this man. Abraham, that Abraham, the Abraham who's the recipient of God's promise, was not equal to Melchizedek. He was inferior to him. The whole of the Jewish nation prided itself on being the descendants of Abraham. It was their highest national honor. They bragged on it. They even challenged Jesus with it in John chapter 8. John the Baptist called them out for their arrogance concerning that. In Matthew chapter 3 verse 9, John the Baptist said, And do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Now, looking at this passage, from the point of view of those Jewish Christians, Christians, the, the point is being made with Melchizedek that God chooses and uses 
those who are faithful to him, whether or not they are of Abraham. Abraham, the father of the Jews, looked up to, was blessed by, and gave a tithe to Melchizedek. And that's why he's chosen as an example. The next question. The next question helps us to understand this man. How is Melchizedek special? Well, there are several things that are special about this man and make him a worthy example for our consideration. First are his titles and position. He is both a priest and a king. Now, that alone would make this man notable to those familiar with the Old Testament. The Jews were not allowed priest kings. No Levite, no one from the tribe of Levi, the tribe of the priests, none of those people could become king. And in the same way, no person, whether he was a king or not, from any other tribe could become a priest. Melchizedek was from outside the line of the Jews. We find no relationship to Abraham other than that that's described or, or that's descended, that we're all descended from Adam. Melchizedek is unique as a priest and as a king. He has the king of Salem by title. He was king over a city and a territory around the city of Salem. Now, we're not for sure where Salem was, but the best guess was that it was Jerusalem. He was king over the city, which would become the capital of Judaism, and he was king before the Jews were a nation or needed a capital. His name breaks down into two words, Melech, meaning king, and Zedek, meaning righteousness. He is the king of righteousness. Now, this is not a title, but his name. It identifies him. It, it, it identifies who he is. He's the king of Salem, the place, and the king of righteousness, the characteristic. And he's the priest of the most High God. Now, in the Roman world, at the time the book of Hebrews was written, there were a lot of priests. Every deity and every idol had priests. The Jews had a lot of priests, all serving at various times and in various ways and capacities in the temple. It was not unusual for a person in any major city to see priests walking around. But Abraham was not in the Roman world. Sure, there might have been those occasionally who would have been known as servants, maybe even priests of Baal and Ashtoreth. But a priest of the Most High God? That was very rare indeed. The Most High God designates that name, that saying, indicates the creator and the possessor of all things. It's talking about God Almighty, the Lord God. It was the Most High God who called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees. It was the Most High God who promised Abraham the land of Israel. It was the Most High God who promised Abraham a child and many, many descendants. And it was the Most High God whom Melchizedek served. Melchizedek, king by name, king by rank and position, priest of the Most High God, is uniquely qualified to be an example for us. One other point that we're going to hit on again in a moment is that Melchizedek is a foreshadow, a type, a, a picture of Jesus. He is not Jesus. I, I don't think he's a pre-incarnate, temporary appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament. He could be, but this passage doesn't say he was the Son of God. It says he resembled, Melchizedek resembled or typifies the Son. He's therefore special. We might ask this next question, what did Melchizedek do? In Genesis 14, 18, we're told that he brought bread and wine to Abraham. 
He didn't bring steak and potatoes. He didn't bring fried chicken and green beans. He didn't even bring Gatorade and a Snickers bar. He brought bread and wine. In the final Passover meal, before he was crucified, Jesus used bread and wine. He didn't use the bitter herbs that were part of the meal. He didn't use the sweet fruit that was a part of the meal. He didn't even use the roasted lamb. He could have, but he did not. Jesus chose to change the meaning of the bread and the wine. He chose to bless us with a new covenant using the same things that Melchizedek brought to bless Abraham, the father of The first covenant. What did Melchizedek do? He blessed Abraham. He called on God, the most high God, to bless Abraham. By blessing him, Melchizedek was seeking God's prosperity for Abraham. By blessing him, Abraham, Melchizedek was seeking God's strength for Abraham. By blessing Abraham, Melchizedek was setting Abraham apart for God. And this was very encouraging to Abraham. It would have been seen also as as an encouragement to the descendants of Abraham who have been blessed in their relationship with God's son, Jesus. Melchizedek also blessed the Lord. Now, By doing that, he's not adding strength to God the Almighty. He's not seeking prosperity for the Lord Most High. No, this blessing the Lord means he praised God. Melchizedek led a worship service which focused on God's power and on God's provision. God had given Abraham victory. Abraham and a few close friends along with the 318 men from his household had defeated four kings and their armies. God did that, and God is praised. The final thing we see that Melchizedek did was receive the tithe. He received from Abraham what Abraham designated for the Lord. Now, if we keep reading, Abraham didn't lay claim to all of the spoils. He gave back to the king of Sodom all that was his and his people's. He didn't keep any of that for himself from what was received. From what he got from the kings, he gave a tenth off of the top. That's the way it's described. He was blessed in victory and he prospered in the effort and he returned a tenth, a tithe, and dedicated it to the Lord through Melchizedek. The focus of this passage is not on Abraham, but I would be remiss if I didn't ask you this question. Has God blessed you? If so, have you been faithful to give to God a tithe of that blessing? Abraham's a good example. Melchizedek, praise the Lord, He focused on the Lord, he sought the Lord's blessing, and he received the Lord's tithe. Melchizedek was a person of interest to the Hebrew Christians and to those Jews who were seeking to know more about Jesus. So it's important to ask the question, how does Levi compare to Melchizedek? How does Levi, the priest, compared to Melchizedek. Well, the the priesthood was the center of the Jewish faith. It was the priest who ran the temple and the temple rituals and the temple's festivals. Priests were essential. The order of the priesthood was established in the book of Exodus with Aaron being the first high priest. Aaron and all of the priests were descendants of Levi. So the comparison's valid. There's a a focus in the passage today speaking about the tithe. Because Abraham gave a tithe to Melchizedek, the comparison between the Levites collecting tithes from the people and Melchizedek is right there. 
The Levites received tithes from their brothers, we're told, from fellow Jews who are also descended from Abraham. The legalish technical argument here is that because Levi, Abraham's great-grandson, was uh, present, even if it was in DNA form when Abraham gave the tithe to Melchizedek, the, the argument is that Levi tithed to Melchizedek. Verse 9 says, one might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham. Levi is therefore less important than Melchizedek. A second way they're compared is genealogically. All priests must be descended and verified to be from the line of Levi. When the Jewish people returned uh, from the disaster, when the Jewish people returned from capture, um, there was a group of people who claimed to be Levites, but they couldn't prove it. Their genealogies were corrupted, I guess. They couldn't prove it, and so they were not allowed to serve as priests. They were seen as illegitimate. Melchizedek is said here to have no genealogy. We have no listing of his mother or his father. He was certainly not descended from Abraham through Levi, but God appointed him priest. God endorsed his becoming a priest. He, he wasn't born into it. He was granted it by God himself. That was important to the Jews, but we're more concerned with Jesus. In what way is Jesus a priest after the order of Melchizedek? Like Melchizedek's, Jesus's priesthood is not genealogical. Jesus's earthly family was from the tribe of Judah, not Levi. Like Melchizedek, Jesus was assigned the job of priest by God. He did not inherit it. Like Melchizedek, Jesus is superior to the priest of his day, even superior to Levi and Aaron. Like Melchizedek, Jesus is outside the law. The Levites became priests inside the law because of the law. Melchizedek predates the law, and Jesus, as the Son of God, the Creator, also predates the law. The legend of Melchizedek was that he lived on, that his priesthood did not end. Jesus' priesthood never ends. Jesus became our high priest. Verse 16 says, because of the power of an indestructible life. So Jesus is serving as our high priest even now. He's interceding for us in heaven at the right hand of the Father even now. We've already mentioned that Melchizedek is a, a picture, an Old Testament type of Jesus. What the Jews admired in Melchizedek, the writer of Hebrews says those things those are amplified in Jesus. So Jesus, like Melchizedek, is better than Levi. What does this comparison, final question, what does this comparison matter to us? It matters to us because of the end goal. Look again at verse 11. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arrive after the order of Melchizedek rather than one named after the order of Aaron? Perfection is not attainable under the old way. Perfection is not attainable under the old law. Perfection is not attainable under the guidance of an earthly priest, even one directly descended from Aaron. Perfection is possible under the new high priest. Not that we can act perfect or that we could earn perfection. We are made perfect because of the service of our great high priest. We're counted 
as perfect in heaven when our sins are paid for by the sacrifice made by Jesus, our great high priest. Jesus is better than Levi because Levi represents what we can do. And Jesus offers what the Son of God already did. Jesus is better. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that Jesus is better. Thank you, Father, that we don't have to go through a priesthood to get to you. We can go directly to you in the name of your son, Jesus. He's already made the way where we can come into your presence, where we can seek your face, where we can seek your favor. And because of Jesus, when we accept him as our Lord and Savior, when we believe that he is who Scripture says he is, that he has done all that Scripture says he has done, when we believe that and receive it, we're already your children. We're already invited into your place. Father, no earthly priest can do that for us, and we recognize that today. Not even someone as great as Melchizedek, who just kind of shows us some of the greatness of Jesus. Help us to understand that, that there's no one that can compare. There's no earthly priest. There's no line of priesthood. There's no person on this earth that can compare to your son, Jesus. And Father, if there's one person today, just one that's listening to this, that doesn't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, I pray, I pray today, Father, that they would, they would admit who they are, that they're not perfect. They could never be perfect that nothing they do could ever attain perfection. And Father, that they would believe who Jesus is, that they would believe he is your son, that he came and lived a perfect life, that he died a sacrificial death for them, that he lives again in power in heaven and intercedes, acts as our great high priest interceding for us in heaven. And that, Father, that they'll confess those things, admit, believe, and confess, ABC. If they'll do that, Father, they will be saved. They will have security and hope, and they will be a part of your kingdom, a part of your family in heaven. Father, help us to go out into our community and share the good news of who Jesus is, that Jesus really is better. It's in his name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.